Check, check on me over there because I was talking. You said, okay. <laughs> well, all right. Welcome to Friday. Um, yeah, I think this is the least amount ever. Even before our spring break, <laughs> we had more than this. That's all right. I don't mind. You guys will learn better. So um, today we're going to... F- uh, Finish chapter 20 for sure. Uh, Your homework on chapters 19 and 20, homework 8 will be due Sunday night. Homework 9 on chapter 21 that I will continue. We've already discussed some stuff. I will continue that and finish that Monday. So chapter 9's homework 9 on chapter 21 will be due Wednesday before class. We'll, we'll review everything then and have another exam on this waves and sound stuff next week on Friday. And, of course, your uh, superhero paper is due by April 1st, which is Monday. Any questions you guys have? Well... Then, let's learn some more about waves, and, and we can get more specific about sound today. Uh, now that we understand what waves are, the types, what parts are called, and some things they can do, let, let, we can start applying it a little more. This is when I think it gets more fun, today and Monday. Uh, to begin with, media that transmits sound, uh, specifically sound, it, remember, we're usually it's air. And it makes compressions increase the pressure and rarefactions where it spreads apart, decreases the pressure. But it can travel through other materials as well. Sound can travel through any elastic material. Elastic. Give me an example of something that's elastic. Nothing. Help her out. Good. Usually not the first one. Steel is elastic. We don't think of it as springy, do we? But it it does. It just doesn't bend as much. It's usually not visible. But yeah. What else springs back? I know you know something. Probably. I'm trying to think, you know, if you whacked it. It depends on kind of the container it's in, how confined it is. But it usually sloshes back, so in a sense. How about a wa- and you're in the bathtub, and you know, you slosh it. Yeah, it springs back, but it's more like a standing wave. But they usually consider water incompressible. So it's, uh, in a sense, yeah, good. I, I seriously know you can think of lots of things that are elastic, and let me define it better. Uh, it get, a force is exerted on it and, and distorts it, its shape. But if it returns to its initial shape, it's elastic. Let me give you an example of something that's not. It's silly putty. You stretch it, whoosh, but it stays that way. It doesn't spring back. Seriously, something you can deform and it springs back. Rubber. What was the well, you guys are dead today, huh? <laughs> what was the question? Examples of things that are elastic. Skin, sometimes. Healthy skin. If you push it, you hope it springs back, right? If it kind of stays depressed, maybe something's wrong with you. <laughs> Sponge. Good. Now you're getting the hang of it. <laughs> what? Cartilage. Cartilage more so, yes. You hope it springs back. <laughs> Rubber band. Rubber. Basketball. A bat. A bat. It deforms and springs back. Quickly, sure. Yes. 
Good. All right. The reason I emphasize is because those are the things that transmit sound. Because if you're trying to create, you have a source of vibration and you're making this thing wiggle like steel, if it can't spring back, it just kind of goes and they stop. The sound's absorbed and deadened. And where do you think that sound energy goes? Into what form if it can't go any further? Heat, yeah, thermal energy. It's trying to, it absorbs it and it gets hotter. Even things that when it transmits it, what if you had a really, 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 really long pipe? Eventually, you know, it doesn't make it five miles down the road sometimes. Thermal agitation, those molecules, kind of like dominoes. And each little bit, it gets turned into heat also. But things that aren't elastic, it does it a lot quicker. So yeah, you can whack steel. This is aluminum. This even resonates. Because I create a vibration here, I compress it. And that compression transpropagates a wave down here and it reflects back on itself. And remember what happens when the, if the wave is up this way, at the same time the wave coming back is up. What do they do? They superimpose, they reinforce, and we call it what kind of? Constructive interference, right. This naturally, so I'm forcing a vibration by hitting it. But it naturally wants to vibrate at that frequency that you hear. And it's based on the material, the speed that sound can travel through it, and its size. But it's zipping back and forth really fast. While I'm at it, I have a shorter one. How do you think it'll sound? It is higher. It's shorter. You get a shorter wavelength. And wavelengths, if the wavelength's shorter, the frequency goes up. That's because the wave speed's the same. The speed of sound in aluminum is the same for both. They're both aluminum. So yeah, you decrease the wavelength, you increase the frequency. Anyway. Um, so solids make good conductors of sound generally because the particles are closer together, relatively speaking. They can respond more quickly to a vibration. When you whack the end, well, the next one's right next to it. So when you bump him, well, he's right there, and he hits his friend. Whereas a gas, you bump a gas, well, it's got to take a bit before it runs into somebody else, at least relatively speaking. <laughs> and so sound is generally not transmitted as quickly in a gas as a solid. And liquids are somewhere in the middle. Uh, do you remember what the speed of sound is? I gave it before, it's in the book. Yeah, 340 meters per second in air, and technically that's at 20 degrees Celsius. You need to know that, that's important. Um, any problems you have, if it doesn't specify, you know, if you're talking about sound, generally like this, you know, it's, my voice is traveling to you at 340 meters per second. In steel, no, water. In water, you think it's faster or slower? Faster, because the water molecules are closer together. It's about four times faster. And in steel, it's about 15 times faster. How many of you have ever put your ear on a railroad track? Have you? Could you hear a train coming miles away? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the energy isn't dissipated as easily in steel. Eventually it is. But yeah, it travels fast through steel and well. But you can't hear it yet through the air. Um, here's an example I, I was proud of. I just thought of it. Um, let's see if I can set it back up without messing it up. This is my crude analogy of this branch might be like a solid. The particles are closer together. And this might be like a gas. They're farther apart. So it's a subtle effect. So keep your eye. We're going to see who wins. I'm going to make a vibration over here at the same time. And then the wave is going to propagate. You can actually see the wave speed through the two mediums. You ready? 
You watching? Because I'm not setting this up again. <laughs> <laughs> Fail. <laughs> well, I went for gusto, and this proves an extreme. If they're too far apart, obviously this would not be a conductor of sound. <laughs> we'll scooch them a little closer. Well, here is one of these. Try this at home. Anyway. You get the idea. It's slower. It takes time for one of them to fall over to get to the next one. Where these are relatively closer, they can respond more quickly. I think you get my point anyway. <laughs> but this one, when you do do it together, does win when they actually hit. Uh, another thing with that, if you cool air down, let's say uh, zero degrees around freezing, where water freezes, what do you think the speed of sound is, up or down? Do you th think it's faster? Uh-oh. What? So let's reason it through. Warmer air is doing what? Yeah, they're moving faster. They got more in kin average kinetic translational energy, right? So they're moving faster in general. So if you create a vibration over here, do you think a neighbor over here will respond quickly or slowly? And you bunk one, and they got lots of energy. They might scoot, they'll scooch over more quickly. They're, hitting, they're running into each other more often. So actually, the speed of sound is faster in warmer air. Generally, when things warm up, because the molecules are oscillating faster, they can respond more quickly to any bunk. It's transferred over faster. Thus, warmer air is faster. This is 330, to give you an idea. So 10 meters per second slower in cold air. Because they're, they're, more, they're sluggish. More sluggish, relatively speaking. Excellent point. Excellent point. Very good. I'm glad because when um, air warms up, it expands. Yes, they are farther apart, but they're, they're uh, are moving faster. And it's kind of a thing of proximity and distance compared to speed. And you remember uh, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So they end up moving a lot faster than the, expand, the distance. Anyway, the point is, what I said wins, dominates. But both effects are happening, and I'm glad you remember. It means you're learning. So, when things are warmer, speed of sound's faster. Okay. Um, so you can do a fun thing. My favorite thing, I grew up in the Midwest, so it's a little more common there. Thunder and lightning. Here we don't get as much thunder as I am used to. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it's fun. You know, you, you see the lightning strike, and then you hear it. Yeah, you can count. So let's say it, you, know, you see it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, and you hear it. Thunder. Well, hey, it took three seconds to get to you. Well, what speed is it traveling at? Speed of sound, it's in air. So distance is velocity times time. Remember that? So at 340 meters a second, four or three seconds, it's about a kilometer. That's cool. <laughs> Remember me spitting off, not me, that was my sister-in-law, spitting her gum off the San Francisco Bridge, or you can drop something down a well. And with simple physics, you can count how long it takes, and you know how deep it was. Well, like this one, you can count the, the difference between lightning and thunder and estimate how far away that lightning strike was. If it took uh, six seconds, you know it's about two kilometers away. So then you can try that next storm. <laughs> yes. 
And that's today's two. Echoes. That's one thing sound can do. It bounces off. And that can mess things up. But you get the idea. Uh, hey, that is what I want to do next. <laughs> Reflections. When a wave reflects off of something, let's say it's coming from air and runs into the wall or on the mountain. So it's coming in. We call that an incident wave because it's incident. That's what it means. And you remember how we had normal forces that were perpendicular to the surface, the supporting force? Well, we call this a normal too. We draw a line perpendicular to the surface where the wave's at, where we're interested. And most people know where it's going to bounce off. When you th it's going to reflect, exactly, and it comes off like this. So we get a reflected wave. And the reason I draw the normal is because we do convention in science, so everybody measures it with respect to the same thing. And they, they, use, they measure this angle. Call it theta 1. That's the incident angle. It's with respect to the normal. That's how we, we measure waves. And the reflected angle whoosh, is the same. So we'd say theta 1 equals theta 2. That's the law of reflection. That's what waves do. Sound waves, water waves, and light waves. Because this, this will come in handy again later. How many of you play billiards or foursquare when you're younger? It's the same law when you're bouncing things. Assuming you're not putting spin on the thing. Other things happen then. Waves don't spin. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. So, if the... You know, sound bounces off of uh, the walls and the tiles. Which one do you think it bounces off better? Brick or tile? Yeah, brick. So this makes more of an echo. It's, it's more of an efficient reflector, we'd say. Or that some of the energy gets absorbed into the tile and less reflects. And in the uh, acoustical engineers do this. You know, you want a music hall to be somewhere balanced. If it's all brick, then the orchestra is still playing, but the notes they just played are still bouncing around, and it's like, ah! <laughs> it doesn't sound that good. So you want to absorb some of them. So they put in uh, deadening things. But what if you absorbed everything? Yeah, it sounds dead. <laughs> it all gets absorbed. And that doesn't sound right to us. So they balance it. And there's a lot of science going in with law of reflections, where it's going to go and how much and at what angle and will it come back this way and then it will interfere with that one. And Do we get constructive interference at this point or destructive? And it might sound really good to where you're sitting because they're constructively adding, but this person, they might be destructively interfering. So they have to compromise. There's a lot of study there, but it's all because it's bouncing around, echoing, reverberating. That's the term, reverberation. Is that when it's echoing? And how much do you want it to reverberate? Yeah, there's a lot of money in that. So if that interests you, yeah, become an acoustical engineer. Um, oh, I don't think I did this demo yet. It's fun. You'll like it. Here, you help. It's called a space phone. You can make transverse waves, right? Transverse. But you can also make longitudinal by compressing. Can you see the pulse reflect? Let's see. I'll do it this way. You see it going back and forth. It's a pulse. But that's the fun part. Hello! Say something else. Say, what do you want me to say? You can hear it echo and see it. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> and and low, low frequencies reflect? And so do high frequencies. Anyway, you would not want a music hall like this. This is a toy, by the way. It's called a space phone. 
You can purchase it. I, I don't remember. Maybe $30. If you want to, though, they have a shorter version. Don't get it. It's cheaper, but it's not as good. <laughs> okay. We can do something else to waves. We can reflect them. We can also refract them. That's when a wave comes in to the normal at a certain angle. And say it goes, changes mediums, like from air to water. It goes into something. If it were to continue on, you might think it just goes straight through. But it doesn't. It refracts. Here's my example. Think of this as a wave front, you know, a compression. Here, it travels faster. The speed of sound here is faster. There's less friction. Whoops. You know, whee! And here, you can, it's a cork. It's a little slower. There's more friction. It doesn't go quite as fast. So what happens when it transitions? Well, watch. It's not a huge effect, but do you see it? Let's see. If I can get it to come in at this angle, do you see that it, it bends a little? That's refraction. And the whole reason it happens is the wave fronts. The wave fronts on this side, right at this point, they're now traveling slower. It's all about speed, wave speed with refraction. That's important. Refraction is about wave speed. If this part of the wave front's going slower and this part's going faster, you know what happens. It turns because this is free to spin faster and this one's slower. So it turns and then until they're both in that medium, now they're both going slower and they continue on straight again. So like up here, if it's going from something where it's uh, faster here and slower here, it bends towards the normal. And those angles are not the same because it's slowing down. You with me? Let's go the other way. Let's say we're coming out of water into air. No, 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 no. Uh, That'd be the other way around, because it's going faster in water. Air is slower. Let's see. This one doesn't like to go as straight. <laughs> do you see it curving? Let's do a little less steep. Well, that was a good one. Kind of went like that. I'll try to repeat. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? So it refracts again, it bends, but this time it bends the other way. So that's kind of like coming back out. And if it was going to go straight, it would continue like that, but no, no, it bends away. And so depending on whether it's moving faster or slower, or from slower to faster, it tells you which way it bends. Example. This is the ground. And you admit a, a wave source here. Let's say this is warm air and cold air. What will happen to the wave fronts? The short answer is, I hope at least, they'll bend. But which direction? We got one vote. Towards the cold, because the speed of sound in air, cold air is faster or slower? Slower. slower. Yeah, it bends towards the slower. So yeah, this will kind of do that. The wave fronts will refract and bend up. So there's a picture in your book. You know, if you're standing over here, you might not hear that sound. But sometimes it can happen the other way. That can happen over a lake where the temperature difference might be more drastic 
over the lake than the, than the ground. And you can get it to bend up or down. Uh, an example in the book was you're hearing somebody on a, around a campfire on the other side of the lake. That's warm air. They talk through it. But then it comes over to the generally cooler air over the lake, and it refracts. That would bend the other way, down to the cold air. And so instead of going off into space, maybe you hear it across the lake. I think that's cool. Uh, I want to mention this about refraction. Let's draw it here. Because it'll come into play again. Uh, it's not supposed to be water, it's supposed to be a shore. <laughs> All right, if you're a lifeguard and you see someone uh, drowning over here, what's the f so, uh, so this is the water and this is the beach. What's the fastest way to get to them? Lifeguards know this. Anybody here a lifeguard? I grew up in Kansas, so needless to say, I didn't work at a beach much. But maybe some of you did. Is it straight? Think about what happens. Which medium can you run faster on? Go through faster? It's different, isn't it? You can go faster through sand, even though it's difficult, than in the water. So at this point, you're, you're cruising along, but then you slow down. And maybe it takes too long. So maybe you want to go over to run to here first, and then swim out. Because you, you go slower in water. Or the other option is run straight here and swim all the way over. I think you probably see that one's not a smart idea. Huh? Which one do you think you want to do? Well, it ends up being something like that. It's a compromise, and that ends up being the fastest path. Because you can run faster in the sand, so you go a little further along the shore, but then you swim. You can actually try this out and time you, you know, if you're going consistent. This one, yeah, you can go faster on the sand, but you're covering longer distance. So it still takes you a little longer, this path. The best path is right here. And you see what happens? It refracts. That's what waves prefer to do. Let's help you remember that's what waves are thinking, the fastest path. And this is true with light also. Light bends because it's trying to take the fastest path, just like the lifeguard. Okay. Which frequency do you think travels farther in air? Or anything for that matter. But Lower why? The greater wavelength, true. Well, well, I mean, lower frequencies have bigger waves. Why would that go further? Allows for more bending. Ah, you're thinking of something called diffraction. Not a refraction, but diffraction. And that is true. Long waves do diffract more. That's different. We'll say, we're saving that one for light. Um, or was that in 21? Anyway, later. But uh, that does contribute to it. Any other ideas? Why, which frequencies might go further in a medium? Think back to uh, this in the speed of sound. Higher frequencies vibrate faster. And so it's like they're res responding more quickly. And if you ever, maybe if you think about it, you generally can hear lower frequencies. You know, somebody's car, boom, boom, boom. But do you hear the, the treble notes? No. They usually get dissipated more, absorbed and turned into internal energy. 
well, they're vibrating faster. And so they run into the medium more quickly, more often. And so there's a more time, greater chance for them to transfer their energy into thermal energy. The bottom line is higher frequencies don't transmit things through as far. Lower frequencies do. So generally you can hear lower frequencies farther distance. That along with diffraction contributes. Does that make sense? So next time you're listening to something and maybe you get it's far away, think about what the source sounds like if you were right next to it. Maybe you know and what you're hearing now. Do you hear a difference in frequencies? I bet you'll, you'll, you'll catch it. Um, more about resonance, another way to think about it. Resonance we did with standing waves when they, let, they match up. We reviewed it when I hit this. This likes to resonate. But to emphasize more, I'm forcing the vibration by hitting it. Certain things, where's my, here it is, mallet. I'm going to force this to vibrate by hitting it. And it vibrates at 512 hertz. 512 hertz. What's its wavelength? Can you figure it out? What's it traveling through to, for you to hear? Air. So what's the speed of air? Yeah. That formula, we want the wavelength. We'll take the velocity divided by the frequency was 512. And I don't know what that is off the top of my head. But it's less than a meter, right? Three-fifths, or somebody can shout it out. But Now you know what the wavelength is. You can visually see it in your mind. But that's a forced vibration. Well, if this is vibrating, and I touch it to something else, it forces the table to vibrate like a sounding board. And that's how a lot, of, a lot of instruments need sounding boards. This would be a bad instrument. It's not very loud. But like guitar strings, the string in and of itself isn't very loud. But you attach it to the, uh, bo the wood of the guitar, and it can make the wood f forces it to vibrate. Let's try the chalkboard. Good tuning forks come with a little box. You can set it in it. And now it makes that box resonate at the same frequency. And it can push a lot more air. It's coupled to the air better. It makes a good sounding board. Another example. Can you even hear that in the back row? Sounding board. It's going to make this vibrate. And if you have one of these, it's really fun. It's a lot louder for me. Because it's actually vibrating through the bones in your head at a different wave speed, mind you, because it's not through air, it's through bone. Faster or slower? Faster. Faster. Faster, it's a solid, yeah. But it's louder. A uh, fun one the book mentions, if you take string and wrap it around your fingers, whoosh, whoosh, and some metal, like a cookie sheet or one of them um, grills, thing, whatever, a hanger can work. Stick it in your uh, finger, your ears. It's dangling down. See, I was hoping Brian would hear this one because he would even hear this. Because if it vibrates through the string, through your fingers, and into your, your bones, your head, directly, you're hearing the sound vibrations through the solid materials, not through the air. And it's a lot louder. <laughs> Have somebody ding, ding, ding with a spoon or something. And yeah... If you're not careful, you can go deaf because it's really loud. So, forced vibrations. Natural vibrations. Everything 
well, nearly everything. Can't think of anything at the moment. Wants to vibrate at a natural frequency. So this meter stick, if I clamp it here and whack it, you can see it wants to vibrate at that frequency. Could you figure out that frequency? Yeah, time the number of cycles, and you can get the frequency and the period, can't you? Well, this is shorter. How do you think it'll be different? Yeah. Different materials want to vibrate differently, but same material would, if it's shorter, wants to vibrate more quickly, naturally. Higher frequency, because it's going faster. So it's taking less time to do a cycle, so the period's shorter, naturally. So if I want to make this go at resonance, I need to drive it at that rate, don't I? And it's easy. Once I get it, that's resonance. Forcing it to vibrate at its natural frequency. And it doesn't take much energy. I don't have to push it very hard because it wants to do that. That's like pushing somebody in a swing. But if I go too quickly, if my frequency is faster than that, It vibrates, but it doesn't resonate, I'm, or too slowly, if I'm like, maybe a little faster. Sometimes it gets big, because they're matched up. But then I'm out of phase, I'm out of step with it, and it dampens it. So I need to be a little faster. That's resonance. These like to resonate. They're called boom whackers, because you whack yourself. And what it does is it forces the air inside to vibrate. Compressions, rarefactions. They move to the end. They reflect and come back. And because of its size, its length, that determines the wavelength that's going to get set up. So which one? Mm, let's try this one. No, I like this one. How will this one sound? Yeah. Yeah, higher. Shorter wavelength. Yeah. You can actually figure out the wavelength, but we'll do that later. Um, they resonate. This wants to naturally vibrate at that frequency, so it will. A chord. Perfect fifth. These also. Anybody play a flute or something like that? So you force vibrations, and again, you increase the pressure, and that increases the pressure inside, so it forces a little mass of air to move up and down in the neck. That's the source of vibration. It pushes the air around, and you hear it. But it's the size of the container determines how much mass it's trying to push around. Bigger? There's more mass, and the air can't, it has more inertia, so the air is trying to push it, but Newton's second law says more mass, more inertia, it's going to accelerate more slowly, and so the frequency is lower. What's that? Let's see, did I write these down? Oh, I didn't write what that one was. Uh, I always wanted to secretly be in a jug band. I, ha I have a wash tub bass and a jaw harp, but I need a jug, right? But that one's even lower. More mass, more resistance. Remember the mass on the springs? Pendula are different. Remember that mass didn't matter on pendulums. But it does when you're actually trying to vibrate more mass. This, that yeah, was, yeah, was good up and down at this frequency. Naturally, it wants to go like that. More mass, heavier string, more air, something, more inertia. So for the same forces, it's trying to resist it more, and so it'll vibrate more slowly. Naturally. So if I, at the top, drive it at that same frequency, I can get resonance with very little energy. Um, 
Here's another sounding board. You know, if you just hit a piece of aluminum, it doesn't sound very good. But you put it on this box, like a xylophone. And that's impressive. It doesn't always have to be in contact with the wood. This is actually suspended by strings here. It's not physically touching the wood. Where do you think it's suspended? What are those points called? Nodes. Very good. This, this bar is actually trying to vibrate like this. I got the bar, and it's suspended here and here. So it's trying to vibrate like this. And these are the nodes, places where it's not trying to vibrate much. So you can suspend it there without damping the motion. And then the, that pushes air around, goes into here. This, the size of this, is like a bottle. It wants to resonate at that frequency. They made it that way on purpose. And it reinforces. It's much, much louder than with the bar itself, kind of like the tuning fork. We talked about interference before. Let me show you a couple examples. Remember where the waves, constructive interference, and they're in step, in phase, or if they're out of step, then when one's up, one's down, they destructively interfere. So I'm going to send the same frequency to this speaker as I do this speaker. And it's going to be the first time 1100 hertz. And gee, it's going to go at 340 meters per second. Could you figure out the wavelength? I hope so. 340 divided by that, right? Yeah. Anyway, you're going to hear a wave come from this one. For you, does this one have to travel farther? Yeah. So if they're in phase initially, this one's up and then down, up and then down. This one starts out up and then down. But how about when it reaches your ear? Are they together or not? But it's a different distance for you. They, like, this is an example where some of you might hear it loud and some of you not. And if I rotate it, raise your hand if you heard a difference in loudness. Most of you. Good. For some, it's a little more apparent. I'll cut the frequency in half. I'm going to cut the frequency, and that's exactly why, because that's annoying to me. <laughs> what will happen to the wavelength? I'm lowering the frequency. Yeah, so the wavelength will be bigger. Raise your hand if you heard a difference that time, too. Now, it doesn't ever dis totally destructively interfere because we get reflections, echoes, reverberation. So not only are those two paths coming at your ear, but one is bouncing off the wall at this point, and another one's bouncing off there. And so they never completely are out of phase at your ear. But you can hear the difference. Here's two speakers. If I turn this one on, that is only out of this one. It's 280 hertz, just this speaker. I'll, I'm going to send it, like I had a switch where I can connect it, where it's, at, it's coming out of both of them, but in phase or out of phase. So I'll turn it up. I'm going to add this one in phase. Just this one. Add the second one in phase. Do you hear it get louder? It constructively interferes. Now let's try in phase, out of phase. They're both on at the same frequency. But when one's going forward, the other one's going backwards. 
So they're already out of step. That's why they're, they're canceling each other out more than adding together. So just this one, both out of phase. In phase. Okay. And you know why they put speakers in a box? The speaker cone moves forward and makes a compression in the front. But what's it doing in the back? It's making a rarefaction. So it's like a crest and a trough. And the waves can diffract around the speaker. And if those, the wave from the front and the wave in the back can see each other, they can cancel each other out because they're already out of phase. So if you put a speaker in a box, you're blo essentially blocking the ones from the back from being able to destructively interfere the ones in the front. And it actually makes your sound louder than just having the speaker by itself. And longer waves bend around better. And so it's more f the, the canceling effect is more prominent with lower frequencies. So when you, if you just had the speaker by itself, it would sound tinnier, higher pitched, because the longer waves bending around interfere more effectively. I find that interesting too. And another form of interference is beats. I guess that's the last thing I'm doing. And I want, yeah, I've got to give you this one. There's a homework question, <laughs> if you haven't read the book. So in this one, certain frequency. This one, another frequency. That one has a high pitch that comes an, a partial above it. These are pretty, pretty close to the same frequency, but they're not quite the same. And watch, listen to what happens when you play them at the same time. Do you hear that wah wah? Hypnotic. That's beats. This one has a certain wave. This one has a certain wave. But they're not the same frequency. One wave's a little shorter than the other. So they can never com perfectly cancel out. But you've probably noticed this sometimes. You're going along, and at some points, all of a sudden, things match up. Like your, your turn signals in a, at a stoplight. Have you ever done that? Your turn signal. And the other car, and every once in a while you're in sync, they're adding. But then they get off again, and at some point you're completely opposite. But you wait a little longer, and all of a sudden you're, you're back. <laughs> That's beats. It's interference of waves. Superposition. They're adding on top. Sometimes they cancel, and then they don't. Then they cancel, and then they don't. And That's what's going on here. You can hear that they're out of phase, or um, not exactly the same frequency. And if I change the mass on this, move this up a little, that changes what it's trying to move and vibrate, changes its frequency. They're a lot closer. I don't hear beats. But it's very slow. Very slow. Let's make it a little faster. It's slower than originally. And you can tune things that way. Because when they're exactly the same frequency, there's no beats. So the slower the beat, the closer you're getting. And the beat that you hear is the exact difference between the two frequencies. So this one is exactly 256 hertz. 256 hertz. If this is 256, no beats, because they're always together. But if this one's 260 hertz, what's the beat frequency? Four hertz. And you'll hear a wah, wah, wah at four hertz. What if you adjust it and you tune this one and now the beat you hear is 2 hertz. Closer, and you know what this one is now, what? 
258. You're getting closer. What if instead you adjusted this one, it was 260, 256, 260, the beat of four, and you adjust this, and the beats get worse? Or faster, I should say. Well, you tuned the wrong way, and you made this one even higher frequency. Does that make sense? But the, 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 the beat frequency is just that difference. You guys have any questions? Uh, I apologize. I didn't get the clicker questions. But we can, we'll do that at the beginning of Monday in review. And uh, Monday will be more specific to musical sound and instruments. We can have some fun with that. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter.